Let's lift our hearts together and sing of the love of Jesus. you're here today. Amen. Thankful for the mercy of our God. Welcome to the church of Quail Creek. If you are here today and this is your first time in the seat pocket in front of you is what we call our connect card. The only thing we ask of you as our guest is just that you would fill that out during the service. There are offering boxes, two here at the side and there's one at the back. On your way out, if you'll just slip that in, we would love to just have a record of your attendance. There's also a QR code on the top of that connect card that you can scan and give us your information digitally. Either way, we'd love to receive that from you. Guys, the high temperature for Tuesday is 72 degrees. So even though it's been fall for like a week and a half now, it's starting to maybe actually feel that way. That's good news, right? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna turn around to two or three people around you and you're gonna say, hello, my name is, and my favorite thing about fall is and then you fill in the blank and tell them what it is you can't say football though no i'm just kidding you can say football if you want to okay turn around tell two or three folks that you're glad they're here today
chapter 26, verse 4 says, The trust in the Lord forever. Because of the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting God. Let's sing of Jesus our rock today. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Every Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.
Let's start with just an understanding of where we're about to go for at least the next couple of months. Um, Over the next couple of months, I want to walk with you through Paul's letter to Timothy. I, I want you to understand why Paul would write the way he wrote and why this particular couple of books should really matter in terms of how the church moves and why Paul wrote it at all. It's going to really define and shape our understanding of how the church works, of why it works the way it does, and why Paul wrote the way he did to Timothy at all. To not understand its context would mean that you and I would start to read Scripture in an incorrect way, and you and I as believers, as Bible students, we want to read the Word of God with the proper understanding so that you and I know how to one, apply it to our lives, but two, know how to share Christ in an adequate way. So let's start with just an understanding of where Timothy was. Well, to understand it, we have to understand really not only First and Second Timothy, but we also have to understand Revelation. We also have to understand the book of Ephesians. Because Timothy was being sent to the, the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was bustling at this time. It it was probably in the rank of Roman influence, maybe the third most influential place in all the Roman Empire. It was powerful. There are still to this day the remnants of what happened in Ephesus that showed Rome's influence. Number one was that it was filled with people. At its height, Ephesus was between 250,000 people and 300,000. Just to kind of give you what that looks like with how many people lived in Ephesus. Here's the other part. It did not have the land mass of Amarillo. So people were beside each other. They brushed elbows with one another and you couldn't hide away. In Ephesus, the very pivotal point of the Ephesian life would have been a, an, a, an altar to the god Diana. She was worshipped there. There was a meteor that came and hit in Ephesus. They believed it was her falling from heaven. And so they built this massive altar to her there. It was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was massive. They would worship her there. There was a great theater that seated over 25,000 people. To put this in perspective, it would be larger than any NBA stadium. It would be full of people. It was powerful in its day. People would come there. At this altar, people would bring money and have it saved at the temple like a bank. You would make deposits and withdraws from the temple. This was powerful in the time when Paul shows up that he sees this fledgling church and he encourages them and he says, I want to come back here not knowing that he would be imprisoned. So while he's in prison, Paul gathers young disciples of the way and he sends them out to the churches and Paul sends Timothy and encourages him to stay at Ephesus. He's like, hey, listen, you need to stay there because they're going to need some help. They're overrun. You can just imagine if this temple had such influence on their society. It was the bank. It was the judgment. It was everything. And it oversaw the city from outside the city walls. It was powerful. That everybody that came through would be influenced by the influence of this temple. So when we read books like Ephesians, when we read First and Second Timothy, and when we get to Revelation, we have got to know what we're reading. So I want to encourage you, if you're a Bible student, to not only spend some time over the next several weeks reading through the books of First and Second Timothy, but I also encourage you to read a few others. Read the book of Ephesians. Know it because it was written at the same year, what scholars believe, as 1 Timothy. You can almost see this letters going together. So if you want to know proper perspective, that would be first. The next would be to read Acts 18 through 19. So if you were to read Ephesians and 1 Timothy, it was written about 62 AD. Acts 18 through 19 would be about 70 
A.D. So you can just see kind of the after effects of Paul's letters and Timothy's influence. Him trying to call the church back to repentance, to focus. And then in Revelation, we get that about 96 A.D. So this is now 20 years later, what the effects were of the people. So I just wanted to put all of that before you and tell you there's some problems at the Ephesus church. One was false teaching. You could just see the influence of the temple outside the city and these young believers trying to put church together and why this would be a problem in false teaching. The next would be abandoning the truth of what Paul instructed them, what he also gives to Timothy. He encourages them to remember what they were taught. And the last was this, a longing love for Jesus. Paul urges them to fall deeply in love with a passionate Jesus and let it drive them forward. I want to tell you there's three problems that I see with the church of today. False teaching. We're constantly being bombarded by false teaching. And I believe the reason we are is because we have abandoned the truth. How do we know the truth? We have to be students of the Bible. Hear me, dear Christian friend. If you call yourself a believer, you have signed up to be a student of the Bible. That is what you're called to be. If today you would say, you know what, my Bible understanding is weak, purpose your life to be a student of the Bible. Purpose it. Devote yourself to it. Dive deeply into it and be known for it. I want to be known as somebody in my lifetime that handles the Word of God faithfully. But the only way I'm going to get there is to spend as much time in the Bible as I possibly can. So first was, I believe the problem with the church today is false teaching. The next is we have abandoned the truth and we're losing our love for Jesus. And so the same problems I see with the church of today is the exact thing that we see back when Timothy is being sent. Are you ready to go on this journey with me? Then let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you show your word before us? May it change us forever and may we hold on to its truth. Lord, we want to see false teaching for what it is. Lord, we also want to hold on to truth. Lord, Scripture tells us that the truth sets us free and we feel like we have been encapsulated by false teaching for too long. And Lord, may we never lose our love for you. You have desperately loved us while we were your enemy. You loved us and gave yourself for us a a sacrificial tick. May we abandon ourselves. May we fall in full worship of you today. And would you show us through your word, through the life of Paul writing to Timothy to this church, how to adequately follow after you. Lord, we pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to know, the life of you, the life of the church, will rise and fall on prayer. It will absolutely rise and fall on prayer. How do you gain a love for the Word of God? You pray for it. How do you find yourself rejecting false teaching? You pray against it. How do you find yourself deeply in love with Jesus? You pray diligently. Prayer is the rise and fall of the Christian life. When we abandon prayer, we will abandon it all. I can assure you of this. When I spend time with people in my office and they talk to me about their walk with the Lord, we can almost always start with a lack of a prayer life. Almost always. What I've discovered is in prayer, people either pray their desires and hope that Jesus answers as though Jesus is some kind of holy lottery ticket. Or they pray with unexpected Jesus at the other end. I can remember being able to pick up a payphone and talk to an operator. Do y'all remember these years? I can remember this. I remember saying, I don't know the number for blank, and the operator would look up the number for you, probably in a phone book. She was probably, yep, I got you, J.C. Penney's, gotcha, or service merchandise, remember that place? Anyways, and then they would call for you. That is awesome. 
Now what we say is, y'all ready for this? Anybody that has their phone out, this is about to be awesome. Hey Siri. Okay, I was just checking. Anyways, hold on. Okay, uh, okay, we're good. Um, now we just talk to a computer who does the work for us. So that poor lady on the other line doesn't exist anymore. And there are no pay phones. By the way, if you don't have your cell phone and you're walking down the street and you need to call somebody, good luck. Nobody's going to give you their phone to call anybody. You can even say, hey, can you call somebody for me? And they'll go, I don't know them. We live in a different year and a different age where people used to be kind. You could walk into a store and say, can I use your phone? I need to call my mother. And they'd say, absolutely. And they'd slide it over. Today they go, who's your mom? Why don't you know where you are? Why aren't you where you're supposed to be? You know, we live in a different age. In this time in Timothy's life, he's shut up in a day and age that things have changed. When Paul was there, he was encouraging these young Christians to pursue the way, to hold on to Jesus, to abandon this false teaching, and to fall deeply in love with him. And since that time, just a few years that have gone by, he has gotten word back that this church in this booming society has fallen away. And so he goes, Timothy, stay there. Don't leave. Hold on. And he gives them instruction. So we're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says this, and I'm starting there because he starts his thinking with this line. All the rest is intro. And then he says this, First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for the kings and for all of those who are in authority, so that we may lead tranquil and quiet life in godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth." Why does Paul start like this? You know, we just talked that there's big things happening at Ephesus. <clears throat> there's a foreign god being worshipped up on the hill, being known, the epicenter of society. So when he writes to Timothy, he is not just hoping that Timothy gets this. He is showing Timothy exactly what he has heard and seen. Don't mistake this. Paul knows what it looks like in Ephesus. He gets it. He saw the temple. He saw its glory. And he went, that is a false god. And so as he's equipping these young Christians, as he's hoping that they'll catch this, he is trying to show them that this isn't the way. Let me teach you the way. Follow in it walk in it, dive in it, marinate your life in this. And he leaves them and they go, yeah, but I still got to withdraw from the bank. Yeah, but I still have to live next to that worker who works at the temple sometimes. Yeah, but I still wake up every day and see the altar on fire burning, uh, you know, these sacrifices to this God up the hill. Is that the real God or is Jesus the real God? I'm really struggling, Paul, and you're not here anymore. Let me just tell you what I believe about the Christian faith that I think is unique. Only in the Christian faith do we hope that you as a believer figure it out on your own. In every other faith, you are deeply equipped to follow after the heart of whatever God it is. But in Christian faith, we go walk an aisle, be saved, and we hope for the best. And so in your walk with the Lord, you've had to either figure it out or you didn't. And so when we see our young ones move on from households and they walk away from the faith and we wonder why in the world they would leave church world, we have to really decide in our hearts, did we ever equip them for more than church attendance? Did we ever show them that following the way of Christ was more than just showing up to worship service? 
Because if that was it, I can see why they left. Because church is yucky. Let's admit it. Can we just admit that together today? That maybe you're new to this faith thing or maybe you're new to Quell Creek and you've kind of seen church for what it's been over the years and what I've seen together with you that church is full of people that frankly are trying to put it together. And maybe they've been mean to you or maybe they give you those eyes of judgment and you felt that. I understand. I mean, I, I get to stand up here. I get to see eyes of judgment all Sunday long. Uh, but this isn't the way that Paul was trying to teach them to be. He hoped that Christians would come hungry and not for a sermon, but for a savior. If you and I can figure that out, if you and I can start to focus our attention on Jesus and him alone, the rest of it doesn't matter. It won't matter our preference. It won't matter how the pew feels. It won't matter how long the songs were. It won't matter how good the coffee was or if there was a donut waiting for you. Because that's not our reasoning for being here anyway. We come to worship Jesus and everything else just gets in the way of that. You see, that's the problem with where we are today. We believe Jesus shows up best in our preference. Which is why when we read the word of God and it doesn't line up with our preference, we disagree with it. And see, that's the problem with Ephesus. So we have to start with prayer must be practiced beyond our own desires. Paul urges them, and you can just feel this, that young group of fledgling Christians at Ephesus, they get to see oppression every day. Those that worship a foreign God, the government's oppression, they feel it all. And he's telling them, when you pray, this is how I think you should pray. Verse 1, first of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Is that how you pray? I got to tell you, I pray through preference. I pray for those I really like. It's hard for me to pray for those I don't like, that think differently than me, that don't act like I act, that don't vote the way I vote. It's difficult because I've been conditioned to pray in preference and love of myself. And Paul is urging the church at Ephesus that was uniquely persecuted every day when you pray, pray for everybody. And then in verse 2 he says this, for kings and all those who are in authority, why? So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is what it looked like to be at the church at Ephesus. He is giving Timothy the call to tell the people of Ephesus, we aren't supposed to look like our enemy. We're supposed to pray for them like we love them because that's what God's called us to do. That would have been really hard to do that when they showed up to kill you. Not to stand in the street and yell at you. Not to get on another network and talk about you. Kill you and your family. Paul tells Timothy, teach the church to pray without preference. Because only then will they understand the heart of Christ. You see, the Christian life is meant to mimic the life of Jesus. It's not meant to show up and stand on the top tier and get the gold um, in everything that we do. It is meant to serve and die daily to self, to take up your cross and to follow him. That's what it looks like to follow after Jesus. It means that you and I choose to daily die, that Christ may truly live through us, so that anybody that encounters us says to you and I, Y'all are weird. Y'all are weird. Y'all do not look like anybody else. What is so different about you? And we get to say, Jesus. You see, the church at Ephesus was having a problem. They showed up, and in their showing up, they kept getting persecuted. And as they got persecuted, they allowed others to speak. And as others spoke, they started to be changed to what the others said. And Paul says this, don't do it. So how do you stop? You start through prayer. You start through prayer. 
Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. It says this, You have heard that it is said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he has caused his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. By the way, who said these words? Jesus. Before this letter to the Ephesian church. Do you see why Paul would tell Timothy the same thing? Because Paul was walking in the way. And because he was walking in the way of Christ, he could see why Jesus said these words. And even if he didn't love them, he practiced them. I want you to know something. Following Jesus is going to delete your preference. It has to if you're a follower of his. Has to. Which means this. When your enemy shows up, your love grows up. It has to. You know why? Because Jesus would. Jesus never looked unto people and said, listen, you guys, I want to be the toast of the town. No, he served. Even those who walked intimately with him, he washed their feet. You and I have got to learn this lesson. If we want to look like the church that Jesus asked us to be, it'll be by acting how he acted. And I believe it starts and it stops with prayer. It starts and stops with prayer. When I was in high school, I want to tell you how much of not a super athlete I was. I was small, I was weak, and I was slow. I was perfect. The pure trifecta of athleticism. I I wanted to be great. I mean, I wanted to be. I I grew up thinking in the back of my mind, I could be the next Emmett Smith. The problem is, even my torso didn't get to be the size of his calves. But in my mind, I was like, listen, I can do it. I remember watching on the screen, and when he would juke, I would juke. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, okay. I was going to be the next Emmett Smith. Here's the problem. When I put on a football helmet... It's like I also put on blinders. And so I'd be running, not paying any attention to somebody faster and bigger than me. Often that would mean that all of a sudden my feet would go above my head. And I'd be like, how is this possible? I'm floating. Take that, Emmett Smith. I float. Only to know that the ground then came and I went, oh, yeah, I don't float. I fall. Isn't it amazing? I, I grew after high school, but even in my shorter state... It's amazing how fast the ground comes at you. For this church, they felt the ground coming at them all the time. Almost as if they had blinders on. And so Paul has to start at the heart of who you are. I pray that you understand this. Prayer will change your heart. That's why we need it. Because eventually, the more you pray, the more you'll understand the heart of God And thus, your prayer life will change. You ever been around somebody that just prays like heaven is right on their lips? I love hearing people pray. And it's not because I judge. It's not because I'm like, oh, they don't know Jesus. They prayed two sentences. Listen, if you want to hear a short prayer, invite me over for lunch. I do not pray devotional prayers at at mealtime. You know why? It's hot and food is good. And so I just, listen, that's not where I do my devotional. Even as a minister, I'm not going to come in there and offer an evangelistic prayer so that you'll know Jesus because food is good and it's hot and I want it to stay that way. So I just pray and I'm done. But then you get around one of those people that you bring them into a a Bible study or something like that. And you, as a pastor, I'm like, brother so-and-so, would you pray? And they go, yes. And all of a sudden they start praying and you're like, "Woo! angels are singing. Whatever you got, I want a double because Jesus is that good. And you are praying like heaven is really real. 
Like Jesus has really changed your life. Like things are about to happen. You ever been around somebody that prays like they believe Jesus is about to do something? Like I'm not talking about the person that says, but Lord, not my will, but yours. That's a Jesus prayer. You don't get the Jesus prayer. The Bible says those that pray without believing shouldn't expect anything from God. Right? I I love the people that I get around that pray like God's about to do something. Like they know a secret that you didn't hear from God. They pray prayers like, and you know what, Lord? I know you're about to do that. Praise the Lord for it. And you're like, well, I, I don't pray like that. I give God a clause. But God, nevertheless, your will. God doesn't need clauses. Listen, God will say yes or no. He's in charge. He needs no outs. We should pray expectantly. And Paul's trying to tell them, pray for those in authority. And he gives them no out. He doesn't say, and their hearts will be changed. It's not what he says. That's not the outcome. He, he would have said it. He would have said, if you pray for them, their hearts will be changed and your life will be better. Is that what he says? It's not. What he says is, you do this so that you may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who does what one thing. He wants everybody to be saved. We need to pray for people to be saved. If you are not actively praying for someone to be saved, there's two problems. Number one, your prayer life is off. And number two, you don't know anybody that's not. If you don't know anybody that's not saved, it means that you do not have the heart of Jesus. I want to say that again so that you know how this sits. I meant what I just said. If you don't know anybody that does not know Jesus, you do not have the heart of Jesus. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's what he was known for. Don't forget this. The people that pointed that out didn't know lost people. The Pharisees said, oh, he just, he hangs out with the sinners. Because the Pharisees didn't know anybody not saved. They didn't hang out with them. They were too righteous and holy. Their chests were puffed out. Their phylacteries were out. They would walk through the city gates, and if there was a sinner, they'd go, walk away. Oh, hello, brother so-and-so. Thanks for giving so much money at the the synagogue. God bless you. Oh, hello, so-and-so for making the scrolls. God bless you. But a sinner had no place. There's an interesting moment. Jesus' ministry is going, and the Pharisees bring into the center of town a woman caught in the act of adultery. And they're they're all gathering stones to stone her. And Jesus walks in on the scene. And he he sees the woman kind of crouched down low to the ground. She knows her fate is sealed. She's going to die today. And Jesus gets down low right beside her. Which would have been absolutely something that none of those men would do. Period. And he gets down and scripture says he writes something in the dirt. Whatever it is, I don't know. We could all make it up, but it's not in scripture. But then he says, hey, any of you guys that don't have sin, go ahead and start throwing. Did you ever read in scripture where Jesus moves to in that moment? I've read the scripture thousands of times. He has stooped low next to the woman and says to those there, whoever doesn't have sin can hurl the first stone. Where does Jesus go? Nowhere. He's still beside the woman, which would mean had they started throwing, he would have gotten hit. I've always missed that in that scripture. And reading it back just changes it so much for me because two things happened. Number one, they all knew they were sinners, which would have wrecked everybody around them. Oh, these guys are the holy guys. They they don't have sin. What do you mean? He without sin, throw the first, throw it. Why are you dropping your stone? Wait, you taught me that, where you, where'd they go? And Jesus looks at her and says, he raises her up and he says to her, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none. And he says, you're right. Then does he just leave her there? What does he say to her? Go and sin no more. 
Go and sin no more. I want you to know something about this moment. I want you to know something today, Christian. Jesus could have allowed the stoning to happen and would have had every right. He should have hurled the first stone. He had every right. He made the law. He should have been the best. He should have killed that woman instantly and stood over her and said, I told you so! But instead, he got down low and said, I want you to know something. If this is your last day, it's ours. And then he raises her up and he says, I don't want to be your accuser either. Quit sinning. We need to know lost people because Jesus did. He found them. Some of our favorite stories, Zacchaeus in a tree, tax collectors, drunkards. Don't ever forget lepers that society had given away and said, you're worthless to us. He finds them and touches them. He went to everybody. No one didn't get a seat at the table with Jesus. Why is it that the church tells people, unless you sit at our table, get away? It is time we reawaken the heart of Jesus in our time and show people that they matter because Jesus loves them and his church will act like he did. We better start praying, Lord, show me lost people. Not so I can judge them, not so I can point a finger at them, but so that they will know they're loved. And Lord, may the outcome be that they come to know you as Savior. God wants everyone to be saved. That's what verse 4 says. God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved. I want you to know something. I'm not going to sit up here and talk to you about personal theology. I will just let Scripture do what Scripture does. God wants everyone to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4. I don't have to argue with you. In fact, I don't care to argue with you. Either 1 Timothy 2, 4 is not scriptural or it's completely scriptural. It's God breathed. And listen, you may suck in the breath of every teacher you've ever found. I'll stick with the Bible. 2 Peter 3, 8 tells us, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works will on it will be disclosed since all these things are to be dissolved in the way in this way it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of god and hasten its coming jesus is the only way so when paul writes to timothy he knows that temple sitting outside of town he knows it And he urges Timothy that God has a way through Jesus. And he wants no one to perish. And he gives him this warning in 1 Timothy. Verse 5 of chapter 2. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. A testimony at the proper time. Why would Paul write there is one God? Because Ephesus battled this very thought. You see, today, uh, the temple of Diana is not sitting down Sansi. It sits in your living room. It sits on your browsing history. It sits in your relationships. It sits in your tomorrow mornings when you know that you should be spending time with God, but you choose instead to watch some morning show for five minutes rather than spending three minutes with a holy God in prayer and in Scripture. It sits in your room. It's going to sit in your drive from your house to your work. It's going to sit in the grocery line or at a stoplight. You see, there's always a temple erected somewhere. 
The question is, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with a, a Jesus that's really real? Will we simply say to him, I know that you existed. Scientists tell us that. Historians tell us that. Jesus was really real. I just don't believe you're the only way. That's what you have to say today. Either that or you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to you, comes to the Father except through you. You have to make that decision today, and you get to make it right now. You get to make it right where you're sitting. You can choose today to say, Jesus, you are not who you say you are, or I believe you who are who you say you are, and I choose to follow you. There is no other choices. And let me just tell you something, for way too long you have avoided this question and today you're here and you're listening to some broken guy that needed Jesus just like you. And I want to tell you today, you need him. Just like I need him. Just like everybody in this room needs him. So quit playing around and come to know Jesus. Acts 4 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. It is Jesus or nothing. Today, you must pick. You must pick. Will you go to some broken down, false God who is always going to turn us back on you? Or will you follow the way and be a person of change? Will you allow Jesus to forgive your sins and to lead your life? Or will you simply become one of the crowd? I want to tell you today, the crowd will lead you away from God. But Jesus will lead you to him immediately. You need to know him today. Do not wait. Know Jesus today. Heavenly Father, I pray that in this room, there are people that have battled too long with this question, is Jesus really real? And today I pray that they would make the decision to put their hope and trust in you alone. Lord, we don't want to look like the world. We, want to, we just don't want to be ordinary. We don't want to be basic. We want to be changed. And to be changed, we need you. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life that we keep trying to find. What's the answer to life? I believe that answer is you. And so, Lord, because you chose to come and live a perfect life and to die for our sins and to raise again so that death would have no victory, we declare today that you are completely all we need. So we quit searching for broken things that will basically fill a day's worth of satisfaction, and we choose eternity with you. So Lord, may we put one foot in front of another in faith and belief in Jesus, and declare today, I need Christ. May he save me, and may he lead me from here on out. Lord, may you win this moment. May you win our lives, and may we never be the same today. We choose you. Lord, thank you for what you speak over us. Thank you that you speak to our hearts, and thank you for the help to be obedient to do so. May we be changed today by Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to be down here to greet you and talk to you about a decision with Christ. I pray that you prayed that kind of prayer, that you believe in Jesus, and that you're going to trust him with your life. Today, if you made that decision, I want to know about it. One of these guys up here wants to know about it. We want to talk to you about a decision to follow Christ. Would you come?
This has been a great day. Man, from the Bible studies this morning to the worship service, God has just, you know, I've felt God's presence here in a powerful way this morning. You know, it is hard to believe that it's October. Where did September go? Where did the kids, young people, where did the summer go? Man, it seemed like you guys were just getting out of school and now you're back in school. And um, it's just crazy. You know, we feel the change that's in the air uh, starting in October, and, and uh, it's an exciting time. There are a lot of things going on in the church during the month of October. I hope that you have picked up your uh, connections, and it's packed full of different things that's going on. It's not everything that's happening at Quail Creek, but the majority of the things is in the connection, and I hope that you will get a copy of it. And because we're always hearing people say, you know, I didn't know that was taking place. Well, it's in the connections, and so please be sure to get that. I want to just draw your attention to a few of those things. If you look in the middle of it, Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday night, we have a number of new Bible studies that are st- that will be starting. One of those is Grief Share. All of us have experienced a loss at some point in our lives, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of you fill in the blank. We have all experienced those losses. Now, we have a class that's going to help us, especially through the holidays. You know, the holidays can be a tough time. Uh, when we have lost a loved one or when we have had one of those life experiences. Well, starting this Wednesday night at 6.30, if you go down where the offices are at, the Bible studies for adults will be located in that hall. But we start our grief share this Wednesday night, and it's just a class that will help us to uh, encourage one another as we have experienced those losses. One of the studies that I'm excited about is that God uses broken people. And you heard Kyle allude to it today in the service. You know, we're all broken people. And uh, as you read through the Bible, you'll see a number of broken men and women who God used mightily, even after they had stumbled and, and after they had fallen. And God has used them in a powerful way. During the next few months, we're going to look at 10 Bible characters that had stumbled and how God had used them in a mighty way. It's not too late uh, for you to attend vertical marriage. J.D. and Dana Ward teach that on Wednesday nights, and uh, we hope that you'll come and be a part of that exciting study uh, for married couples. We have 11 couples who will be going to Glorietta this next weekend for the marriage conference. We have one ticket that's left for a couple. If you're interested, please be sure to see myself after the service or see JD here uh, just after the worship service, and we'd be glad to get that ticket in your hands. Now, ladies, we have a great event coming up, Uniquely Crafted. On October the 20th, and uh, you can talk to April right here or see Sharon in the foyer. That's a great time where women get together and uh, just enjoy fellowship. They make a special craft, and it's just a great time. One last announcement. I told you there's a lot of announcements. If I took every announcement and announced it to you today, you'd be here through lunch, and I know you don't want to do that. But this is one that just came through to us. Uh, City Church is asking for our help. On October the 14th, they're going to Maxwell's uh, Pumpkin Farm, and they're going. All the tickets are paid for, and what they're asking is that we help them out to sponsor to go with one of their families. This is a great opportunity for us to help one of our sister churches and to help. Uh, families just to go and experience Maxwell's. You know, there might be a a single mom from City Church, and she has three children, and what a great opportunity for us just to come alongside and walk with them through Maxwell's. And if you would like to do that, that's October the 14th, 530 to around 9 o'clock, 
see Sharon in the foyer. A great way for us just to reach out with the love of Christ. So I'm glad that you're here today. It's been a great day. Be sure to invite someone uh, to come on Wednesday night. We have choir and orchestra and praise uh, team that's practicing, getting ready for Sunday. So, and uh, come on, let's let's come back together Wednesday night and let's worship and study God's word. Well, let's stand and I'll dismiss in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and. Father, we thank you for the change that we're feeling in the air, the, the freshness of the mornings. And Lord, you're just, uh, uh, you have blessed us in so many ways. And uh, Father, we, we just want to pause and pray for the folks that are in Florida and on the East Coast, Lord, that have lost so much. And uh, Father, we just ask God that... Uh, you would just draw near to those folks. Father, provide for their needs. Uh, Father, if we can reach out with the love of Christ from the panhandle, Father, I pray that we would do that. And uh, Father, if our disaster relief teams are deployed, then uh, Father, just uh, let us go with the love of Christ. And Father, I thank you for the way that you have moved in our hearts today. And, uh, Father, we just look forward to coming back on Wednesday uh, to worship you, to praise your holy name, and to study your word. So, Father, we pray your blessings on us today and this week. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. God bless you.